now? Good, thanks. <laughs> so the answer is no, it was not on. Um, so um, we had left with this uh, notion of, of, of using logic, either propositional or first order logic, to represent uh, the problem space. Um, and we talked about using um, these kind of add and delete list operators and actions and doing sort of uh, either backward chaining or forward chaining uh, solutions to those problems. And we had generated these linear plans and we saw uh, sort of through like Sussman's anomaly where we noticed that if you try to assume independence of those sub goals, you know, get one on top of the other, or the other one on top of the others, they could clobber each other. And it w didn't work very well. So there are certain kinds of interactions among the goals that made it uh, not particularly a great solution for certain kinds of problems. So then we moved on to something called, uh, we were just starting with this partial order plan. plan. So let's go on to that. So we're going to talk uh, and go in through some detail about partial order planning. Um, we'll go in and explain another type of planning, which is uh, uh, just another kind of approach through a similar space, but not quite the same space, um, which is called graph place planning. And it has the delightful thing of saying uh, you develop a plan graph in order to use graph plan algorithm. So if I mess that up, just raise your hand and say that you messed up the algorithm's name is graph plan and the data structure's name plan graph. Okay. Um, and then, in addition, after going through these two things, we'll talk a little bit about each of these things, not in great detail, but just to give you some familiarity so that if you see these terms, you understand them, what they want to use. Um, hierarchical task networks, case-based planning, contingent planning, replanning, and then multi-planning. And if there's any time at the end of that, um, I can go through sort of this expanded case of a multi-planning example, a scenario, that uh, is really interesting because it's not only distributed, which is the emphasis on the multi-case, a multi-agent planning, but it also required replanning. It also caused, uh, you had uncertainty, you had partial observability, and I'll explain what all those things mean, um, but only if we have time, we'll, we'll talk about through that scenario, okay? All right, so let's pick up here. So as we said, we, uh, we, had, we talked about linear planners, and we, we build up these totally ordered sequence of plan steps, totally ordered, meaning that each step is a sequence after the other. Um, and then we're now talking about an approach where we use a nonlinear planner, uh, which builds a plan as a set of steps with some temporal constraints. And note uh, that now we don't, we no longer, if there's no obvious reason to have to sequence actions, they can stay unordered in the plan. And note that if you really need a totally ordered plan, you can always turn a partial order into a, an ordered, totally ordered plan by uh, inserting um, arbitrarily between unordered ones some precedent constraint. Um, so one refines a, uh, uh, a, a partially ordered plan by either adding a new plan step. Um, so which we're working now, instead of working in state space, we're working in plan space, and then we've talked about this already, but we're, we're adding plan actions and creating a plan. We sort of start with a beginning and an end to a plan, and then we kind of fill in the middle. All right, and those are the states there. Um, so either we're going to add a new plan state or we're going to add a new constraint, which is going to be required due to some kind of conflict if you don't do them in a particular order, those steps in the plan that you're generating. So uh, as I said, it can be uh, linearized kind of trivially. Okay, so the central concept behind a uh, partial order planning is least commitment. Um, the idea here is that you don't commit it to a particular order in the sequence until you have to. And by delaying that decision, you can keep yourself out of certain uh, difficulties, such as Sussman's anomaly. All right? So only choose the actions and orderings and variable bindings that are absolutely necessary, leaving other decisions till later. Um, again, if you don't have to sequence them, don't. Leave them floating. Um, Avoid early commitment decisions that don't really matter, as I said. Um, the linear planner always chose the next step in a particular place and would get in trouble as a result of that in certain cases. Um, a nonlinear doesn't, it just uh, might either add a step or it might add a uh, sequencing constraint. So we had gone through this before, but the idea is that every partial order plan starts basically the same way. Um, if you think of our, our actions, you have preconditions and effects. Uh, there's always this kind of artificial first uh, step, which is the, um, uh, of the plan, which is a um, is a uh, action that has uh, no preconditions and it has the effects being the initial state. And the goal is always going to be sort of the reverse of that, which is it's going to be all preconditions and the only uh, effect is that you're finished. And now we're going to fill in the middle here with steps in the plan. 
So we've gone through this before, but you know, real simply, um, this is just a simple thing where you have a bunch, you have a, essentially four operators, and the four operators correspond to putting your socks, one sock on, putting the other sock on, and then once you have your socks on, you can put your shoe on, and you can put the other shoe on, right? And when you start off, um, you know, you have steps here. You, you start off with your action start, and that's what I was saying, where, and the, uh, the, uh, the effects of this is going to be uh, that you want to get your, um, uh, I forgot what the goal is here, oh, is get your right shoe on and your left shoe on, okay? And the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be the uh, preconditions on the goal state, and now you just kind of fill it in. Of course, there's this uh, trivial uh, constraint here that says S1 has to come before um, S2. Right, the start has to come before the finish. So as you, if you fill it out, looking at that thing, um, you can fill out, and notice that there's no uh, ordering constraints between these and the middle here. So there, there's no commitment to those things. They can go in any order you want. You can do these two, and then these two. You can do this, then this, then this, then this. You, know, you can do whatever you want. But this is a reasonable plan. And if you want to linearize it, then you can insert those kind of constraints. So the partial order plan will create this kind of a plan, right, as opposed to a linear set of steps and being devoted to that particular set of steps. So let's see a little bit of how it works. So the first thing you do is you create a start node with the initial state as its effects, as I said. Create a goal node with a goal as its preconditions. And so you, you're, you see that you're already thinking, all right, I must be doing some kind of matching up, as you would expect from the post conditions or effects to the preconditions. And I'm trying to work this together so that I'll have a, a, a consistent binding of those uh, actions such that I will be able to generate a plan. So I'm going to create uh, an ordering link from start to goal. As I said, you, you're going to start before you finish. And then you do this loop here. So while there are unsatisfied preconditions, so you notice the preconditions only come from the goal right now, right? That's just the desired states you want. You choose a precondition to satisfy. Um, you just choose one of them, any one that's not satisfied by the uh, effects that were on the start state. Um, you choose an existing action or insert a new action whose effect satisfies the precondition. Well, when you're beginning, there's no action there. Right? So now we look through our actions and we say, is there any way of the effects of those actions that can satisfy the precondition of that goal state that I've selected? Right? So I go so, um, if, if there is no such action, then I'm going to backtrack. But in this case, there has to be one. Um, insert a causal link from the chosen action's S effect to the precondition. So there's going to be an arrow from that effect. You know, if it says add something, it better be required in the precondition of the one that you're trying to satisfy. And then resolve any new threats. Uh, and we'll talk about what a threat is in a second. All right. So this is just some notation. Um, solving the, the Sussman anomaly using the principle of the least commitment that the planner avoids, as I said, making that problem where you try to put one on top of the other, and you have to take the other one to put on top, and, and then you get into an inconsistent state. All right. So here's the notation things in the, in the subsequent uh, slides. Um, the causal links, as I said, those are the ones where we add support when we add a an action, and we look at the effects of that action and say, oh, this part of that effect is going to support the, satisfying the precondition of some other part of your problem that you have set up. Um, those are going to be linked together using causal links. Um, ordering constraints, which are light arrows, indicate uh, that if there is a problem in the order that they have to be done, and they have to be done in a particular order so that one doesn't undo the other, then you put in these things to move the action saying, this action has to occur before that action. All right, and we'll show you an example. Okay. So let's look at a Sussman's anomaly here with this plan. All right. And we start off, and we want, we have C is on A, B is clear, C is clear, A is on the table, and B is on the table. All right. That's our initial state. And we want to get A on B and B on C, right? So this is a goal state. And as I said before, these are going to be the, this is just going to look like a, this action is just going to look like, right? No, no preconditions, only these effects. And this is going to look like uh, no real effects um, and these preconditions. So that's how they look just like any other kind of action. So 
So then we look at our, act, our operators and we say, OK, uh, first of all, I'm going to pick one of these preconditions to see if it's satisfied. And I suppose I pick on BC. Just that's in that loop we saw earlier. We say on BC. Is on BC here? No, I can't support it. So now I'm going to look at my operators to find out if any of those operators can support that. Right? So I look through my operator table and I say, oh, I got this one move B from table to C. And the post effect of that is on BC. So I add this to my plan. And I put in my causal link here. This is supporting this. Right? OK. If I pick this one, I say, oh, clear B. Hey, I already have to do this. So all I have to add is the causal link. I don't have to add an action for this. You know, if this is not satisfied, basically. But this is satisfied. So I pick that. I'm all good. Didn't have to add an action there. All right, so now I pick on AB. And I said, oh, OK, I got to move A from table to B. All right? Um, and so that's going to give me um, on AB here. Right? So I can add my causal link here to support that. And the problem is, is that I have this clear B here, here, right, that has to go like this. And so um, not clear B represents a threat, right? Because we have a conflict, contradiction in these things. They're inconsistent, right? So now I need to do something to resolve the threat. So what I do, if you notice from here, you have this one down here and up here, but they're really in parallel. I move this up here, OK? So if I do this one first, OK, um, and then I do this one, um, then it doesn't matter that beauty's not clear. So just by ordering them, I get out of that threatening condition. All right? Okay. So you add constraints to order to get out of threatening situations. And you detect threats by it being inconsistent. OK, so this is the fully elaborated plan. And you can imagine this is so simple, but in a real complex thing, you can imagine a diagram that would be partially legible. But here what you have is you have the, the causal constraints on ABC. And you have each of those steps that are just filled out exactly the way we did with those. Um, and you end up with exactly the kind of plan that will work for Sussman's anomaly here. Right? If we do a start, we move C from A to, to table, move B from table to C, and then move A from table to B. That's exactly the plan we'd want to see. And so here we've avoided the pitfalls of devoted, or committing ourselves to a particular order early on, not being able to solve this problem. All right? So let me go through an example, uh, another example of this, just uh, uh, kind of quickly. We're back to the drill and the milk and bananas. Um, so the idea here is, again, we're at home. Uh, it sells uh, at the hardware store a drill, and you have um, at the supermarket you can get milk and you can get bananas. And what we want to get is we want to be at home, we want to have milk, we want to have a drill, and we want to have a banana. All right? So, obviously, the next step we need to know is what kind of operators do we have? Right? So, let's look at the action representation here. Well, we have, um, we start off, we have the start. This is, these are those pseudo ones I was telling you about, right? So we have the start, and the effect is the initial state. These are all the initial states. And this is the, uh, or sorry, the finish one is uh, the preconditions are, are the goal states, right? So those are those pseudo operators that you always have to do. And then you have the operators that are the action ones, which is go there, which is the preconditions is at here, effect is at there, and you're not here, <laughs> all right? And the same thing here with uh, action of buy X. The precondition is that you have to be at the store, and the store sells X, and the effect is you'll have X. Now we're going to try to apply these operators. Now notice that these things have uh, variables in, these, in, these, uh, in their forms here, which means that you, it's going to require uh, unification against uh, uh, the literals that are in the problem. Um, now, I'm not going to go into great detail about that here, but it's usually just through substitution, and you have to do, as you would imagine, a uniform substitution throughout those rules. Okay. 
So here's the initial plan, right? Is that we start and we have our, our, our start condition and our initial states and we want to get to uh, the goal state. So this part of the pro uh, partial plan is, is sort of achieving all the haves. You know, all the things I have to do, right? So if I'm at set and it sells a drill, a drill, I will have a drill. So this is going to solve the have drill, right? And this is going to solve the have milk. And this will sell, you know, the bananas. And meanwhile, I'm still at home, all right? Now, it's not a complete plan because we still have unsatisfied uh, preconditions. Um, but um, the point here is to, uh, and, and ungrounded literals here, or uh, variables. So the next thing is to do is set the causal links for preconditions of cells. All right, so there they are. And now we're going to achieve the at. So we're going to now ground these variables here into uh, so we can get them into literals. And we want to say at x is all right, we're going to go to the hardware store, which is going to satisfy this precondition. And this will work here. Same thing uh, if we're, we're at the, this is the causal link for the halves. So we still have that working. Um, we have this precondition that's unsatisfied. But we do the go sm, that satisfies this. And that satisfies that. And we're... Again, good to go. Still, things aren't completely uh, realized. One of the problems that we have is that if once we uh, ground this, see before it was just x, but once we ground where we're actually at using the precondition that came from the, I mean the postcondition on the start, then this is at home, and this is at home. So now we're going to have a threat because they can't both be that way, right? But when I'm done here. I'm going to be at the supermarket. So if I'm at the supermarket, that's not going to help me, right, to get from here to here. So I need to do some kind of resolution there. So as I showed a little bit earlier, but this is sort of the formal uh, notation for it, when you have something like this, uh, when you have a threat, typically what you have is something that requires uh, C down here. And, uh, imagine some precondition requires C here. And then you have another one that asserts not C. Right? And so that's the problem. And the two ways you can do it is you can imagine uh, demotion of S3, which means that you put S3 up before this. And the reason it's called demotion is because you notice that as the plan goes on, that effect disappears. Right? And then S1 and C is asserted here. Or you can do promotion of that, which means S, do the S2 to do this, and then you have not C, and now not C. Uh, is permanent throughout the plan to the next step. So that's why it's uh, a promotion of it. All right, so using either demotion or promotion, you're going to try to reconcile the threats. So here what we do is um, we, um, we actually push the, the supermarket down, promote it, and we say go to the home, um, we say from home, Go to the hardware stair, and then from the hardware stair, we say go, and we ground this to, instead of being at home, we now ground this to the hardware store, and we pushed it down lower in the plan. And we go to the supermarket. Uh, at the supermarket, we do this. At the supermarket, we do this. At the supermarket, then we go home, and then we have a complete plan. All right? So by using this promo uh, promotion or demotion, you're able to reconcile the threats because now the ordering keeps them from violating each other. So there it is. There's the complete plan. And as I said, those are the causal links that you can see and the ordering. All right. So I'll go over briefly here. This is just sort of a, uh, sometimes, you know, in the books you look at it, they give you a formalism, but it's at such an abstract level that um, it's not much more than English. So I'll go through this again and we'll say how it looks. Um, the plan, we make the, plan, the minimal plan here, the first step, and that's just the start and finish piece. Um, and then we say, oh, is this a solution? Great, I'm done. I, everything, all my preconditions are done. I'm satisfied. Otherwise, I have to select some uh, sub-goal, um, some, some preconditions, uh, choose an operator, uh, you know, one of the things that's going to be able to satisfy that sub-goal that I'm trying to I select it. Um, and then, if there are any threats, resolve the threats by promotion or demotion. 
the uh, select sub goal is basically uh, pick a plan step that you need from the steps in a plan, those preconditions, right? Uh, with a precondition C that has not been achieved. Okay, and then choose the operator. Um, you're basically uh, going to go through the uh, go through your operators and find the one that's going to be able to uh, satisfy the preconditions of the sub goal that you're trying to solve for. All right, and then you add those causal links and add the ordering. If S is new, if you can satisfy it by an existing one, then you don't have to worry about it. it, and you don't have to add a new one. If it is a new one, then you have to add it to the steps in the plan. You will add uh, ordering constraints um, if you need to to reconcile things. Okay, and then when you resolve the threats, you said after you detect the threats in the links, uh, choose either the promotion of it or the demotion of that, whichever one is going to work to resolve those threats in order to get the sequencing of the preconditions and the postconditions so that they're not co contradicting each other. So if it's not consistent, then the plans fail. If you can't find a solution by either of those two steps, those are the only, those are the only two tricks you have in your bag. All right? Okay. So POP is sound and complete. Uh, the partial ordering planning algorithm is sound and complete, provided that the non-determinate algorithm is implemented with a breadth first or iterative deepening search strategy. The idea is that you're, uh, you know, whether how you're how you're walking those things, as long as you uh, eventually you're going to find a series of steps to do it. Now, of course, you know, if, if it's a, a infinitely looping plan, there's no solution to it, but otherwise you will find these the steps. Given the assumptions here, which is that we have these uh, non-decomposable actions, these uh, their set states, you know, all the things that we talked about earlier with the uh, linear planning. Okay, so the advantages of partial order planning is it takes only a few steps to construct a plan that would take thousands of steps in a standard problem-solving approach, because you're sort of doing this kind of uh, mean this back end. You know, you're you're working both top down and bottom up in the plan. And so you're trying to work together until you get to the pieces. And you're not being, if you had to work at all, all the total orderings, um, that would be a huge number of things. Here you're not looking at all total orderings. Uh, the least commitment nature of the planner means it needs to search only in places where subplans interact with each other. Otherwise, it just keeps them floating and independent of each other. And the causal links allow the planner to recognize when an, an abandoned the doom plan without wasting a lot of time. It basically prunes very early on. All right. So it's a pretty powerful approach to doing uh, planning. Uh, that said, there are many, many planners that don't use this approach. Okay. Okay. So as I said before, uh, and we've noted before in the previous examples, you can these question marks are just really just variables. It's a different notation on this slide. Um, and when you have these things, uh, you have to do this unification of taking a literal and grounding in there when you instantiate the operator as you're applying in the search. Uh, there are some little trickinesses that come out as a result of having variables. All right. Um, so as I said, they have, the operators have to be instantiated. You have this kind of template of an operator, and then when you actually apply it, you do this unification and substitute the variable in there, and that gives you the instantiation of that operator for that particular time. Uh, let me go into where some of the issues. Uh, well, here here's some of the ideas of this inst instantiation here. Um, if you had an operator that had this as a as a precondition and you had A on B, then you'd have to substitute A on B throughout every place that you have the, the variables A and B. Similar down here. So uh, the thing with the generic operators on the atlas is that there's no explicit uh, state representation. Uh, must be handled through partially instantiated operators. So you might have you know something that has literals, something that has some variables. Um, uh, you have to start asking questions because now that you don't have you know one-to-one -one correspondence things, if you see something that has something like this as a condition, not at X, and you have to have a, re a requirement to be at home, are they in conflict to of each other? All right, and so that's a little bit. It's it, it's more difficult. Um, it's hard to deal with potential threats. Um, this is actually there are different approaches to this. I'm not going to go into details about this. I'm just making you aware that it does make it more difficult. Okay. So, as I said, there are some techniques for dealing with threats. Not all of them are work that well. Uh, you can resolve, uh, if you have the idea that you have this variable, and maybe you want to uh, restrict 
the values, the range of values that can be assigned to that variable in order that it's consistent with uh, the literals that you do have. So, you know, you can, as long as you're saying not at something, you know, you might restrict what that means. So, all the possible threats are resolved immediately by giving the variable an accepted value. In this case, you ground everything immediately very early on. It's kind of not in the vein of the least commitment. It becomes very eager commitment in terms of the assignments there. Um, resolve with inequality constraints. So, this allows the constraint x does not equal home. Needs a more general unification algorithm. But it allows you to say, okay, we'll only look in the possible variables in this constraint. And they can be consistent in a variable and a literal because we're saying in this variable, this variable will, cannot have that value. All right? And then resolve later. Basically, just solve the plan and then check for consistency later and see if that works. If not, go back and uh, try again. OK. So now we've gone through uh, linear planners and nonlinear planners with partial order planning. And now there's this, uh, another notion of how to do it, which is this graph plan algorithm. Um, graph plan algorithm is a little bit like both in some sense. But instead of having a linear set of actions that you have to do, like you did in our linear planning, you have sets of disjoint actions. And you have state, action, state, action, state, action. And I'll show you what that tree looks like. And by creating this tree and then walking through this tree, uh, searching the tree, actually, um, you can uh, find solutions to a great number of problems. And some of the great benefits is that creating this tree uh, is known to be done in polynomial time. And so you, and, and the, um, you can end up finding things fairly quickly in most cases, but there are still worst case performances. Okay? So uh, a planning graph is uh, the basic data structure underneath the, that graph plan works on. And the basic idea between, uh, about a planning graph is, again, this notion of having a sets of actions and states moving along in sort of the sequence of steps. And again, I'll show you this in a moment. So the odd layers um, are the state levels, represent the, the candidate propositions that could possibly hold at that step. So in the beginning, that would be your initial state. And then every operator that you could apply will create additional effects. Now, no, not all those effects, not all those operators could be applied simultaneously, right? So they're not consistent, guarantee, but they would create additional uh, effects. And that would be the third layer. So the first layer would be the state would be all the preconditions in the initial state. The third would be all the preconditions um, that were then generated from those operators on those initial states to create those. Uh, we'll go through this in an example, but that gives you the idea of it. And the even layers are the actions, represent candidate actions that could possibly be executed at step I, including maintenance actions, which is do nothing. Now, this, these are always kind of annoying, but you'll see why you need to have them. No op operations. Uh, the, the, again, the idea here is that given any state, I mean, given any set of uh, preconditions that may hold, these are all the operators that you can then apply because those preconditions meet the preconditions of those operators. All right. The arcs represent the preconditions. Uh, you'll see this in a second, and adds and deletes. Uh, we can only execute one real action in any step, but the data structure keeps track of all the actions states that are possible. So in a way, it's just a way of saying all the possible states that can come out, but it's kind of a flattened down tree of it. And you'll see how that might benefit us. All right, so uh, what are some of the properties of, uh, of a graph plan? Um, first of all, uh, the strips operators, we can still use that. Uh, the conjunctive preconditions, no conditional universal effects, no nego uh, negations. Uh, the planning problem must be convertible to propositional representation. We've seen this before in our previous examples. Can't handle continuous variables, temporal constraints. Very much the same as before. Uh, problem size can grow exponentially. Um, it's going to find the shortest plans by some definition. Shortest is typically uh, uh, the definition that's most commonly used is number of actions applied. Right? And it's sound and complete and will terminate with failure if there is no plan. Okay. What actions and what literals? Um, an action in level A, if all of its preconditions are present in level S of I, that's the way you would generate. So if you're at level... Uh, if you're at, uh, in level A of I, if all of its preconditions are present in level of S of I. So if all of its preconditions are met, then you can apply those actions. And those are only those ones you can use. Um, add a literal in level S if it, is, if it is in the effect of some action in level A. So if you have all these actions in one level, you look at all the preconditions and you add all those for the next level. 
And level S of O has all the literals from the initial state, as I said. Okay, so let's look at a simple domain for this. All right, a simple domain is um, you have x at y, you have fuel r, and in x um, r. All right, so x is in the rocket r, rocket r has fuel, and x is at location y. That's the initial state. The actions are to load x onto r um, at location l, and x and r must be at l. Those are the preconditions. Unload X of L, unload X from R at location L. R must be at location L. Okay? Move X to Y. That means move rocket R from X to Y. R must be at X and have fuel. All right? And so the graph representation I'm about to show you, the solid black lines are the precondition effects. The dotted red lines are the negated preconditions effects. Okay? And we'll see what that means. All right, so let's start off. Here we are, S of O. We're creating this planning graph, this basic data structure. And we have at um, A at L, we have at B at L, we have the rocket at L, and there's fuel in the rocket. Okay, so now we're going to look at the actions at A at zero. So these are the prerequisites for load AL, so therefore I can do load AL. I need the rocket to be at L, and I need A to be at L. And those preconditions are met, so given the operators I had on the previous slide, that one we can add to this uh, level. Same thing with here. Those preconditions are met, so we can add load B of L. Move LP. Works all right. The robot's at L, so that's a precondition. That we need to have fuel, so we can do this one. All right, so now we've gotten our second level done in the plane graph. Let's look at our third level here, which is the states in S1. Remember, this is going from states, from the state world to the actions to the states. So here, we could be at AL, at BL, at RL, and fuel and R. So here, look at this. So if you look at this, um, if you load A to L, then all, all these, by the way, this at AL, at BL, at R, and fuel R, are all a result of taking no action. So imagine no ops, basically. So if I didn't do anything, I'd still have fuel, right? If I didn't do anything, I'd still here. So all those are just by fact true, all right? Next, we're now looking at each one of these things, and we're saying, oh, uh, that means if I do this load AL, then A will be an R, but L will no longer be an A. So the, the dotted red line is a negation effect. I'm not, that's not going to hold true. Same thing here. Um, no longer going to be an L, but B would be an R. Same thing. Okay? If I do move LP, then R is no longer going to be at L, and I've used up my fuel, my rocket. But I've been able to assert um, that R is at P. Okay, so let's look at the next tier. So now I have these conditions here. Um, and don't think of this as being negated, but this actually exists here. Okay, because as you notice, the no op will make this work. Right, so don't get confused by that. Uh, at AL and at RL. Um, means I can load A into L. Again, similar things here. We can move L to P um, here because we're at RL and we have fuel. So we can move, um, move that over to P. Again, we can uh, add RP and we have fuel, so therefore we can move from P to L. So again, we're looking at all the possible things that could happen starting from this initial state. All right. I'll go through these. Again, all these, remember, a lot of these happen just because of the, um, because of the no-op. If you can have them here, you just no-op and you get all the way over here. And again, we're going through the possible uh, states that could be uh, affected by these things. 
and we add anything that's new. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay. So this is a plan graph. This is how you're going to generate a plan graph. Um, and the way the plan graph works, you will see how we leverage this to generate a plan. Go through these kind of quickly. Okay. Okay. So a valid plan is a planning graph in which the actions at the same level don't interfere, delete each other's preconditions add effects. Each action's preconditions are true at the point in the plan. Um, so, and the goals are satisfied at the end of the plan. So the idea here is that if you can set, look through this plan graph and collect a set of actions that are consistent and don't, aren't violated by any uh, of the other actions that are in there, then you have a plan. And you're going to be searching this plan graph. But in order to understand that, um, one of the things that's going to come to your mind here is like, oh, how do I know things are in conflict with each other? How do I know steps are in conflict with each other? What I saw was a bunch of actions, and I didn't know which ones were in conflict with each other. So you have to annotate the plan graph with these mutex relationships. These have to be done. Either this one can be done or that one done. But they both can't be done in the same uh, state. So um, two actions or literals are mutually exclusive. Um, as at step i, if no valid plan can contain both actions at that step. Okay, so you can quickly find and mark some uh, mutexes. And these are um, some of the classifications of the types of mutexes that you might be looking for that you annotate to find those conflicts. One is the inconsistent effects. If you have two actions in the same level uh, whose effects are mutex with each other, um, that basically means it's like saying one asserts A and the other one asserts not A. Right? They are not going to be consistent with each other. Uh, interference. Two actions that interfere, uh, the effects of one negates the preconditions of another. So if in order to do something, if something says not A, and the other one has A as its precondition, then they can't be done in that sequence. Um, com competing needs. Two actions are mutex if any of the, uh, the preconditions are mutex with each other. So if the preconditions, in fact, can't be together, then those two rules consequently can't be together in the plan at the same time. Uh, inconsistent support is two literals are mutex if all the ways of creating them both are mutex. If there's every way that you can get to those states are mutex themselves, then those things are mutex, those actions. So let's go through some examples of this. All right. So looking at this one, move LP and, and the no op here, right? Um, and also this one to here where move LP and move PL. But let's focus on this one right now. Um, the idea here is that these are inconsistent effects because uh, the no op here would say that I'm at RL, right? But if I do move LP, I'm going to be at P and not RL. So those have to be exclusive of each other. Either I'm going to do the no op or I'm going to do the move LP, right? All right. Um, Interference. Um, this requires for B to be at L. If I do this action, it's going to put me at, at uh, this is going to put the robot at um, P. And you're not going to be able to do this because it's not at L. All right? Similar with that over there. OK, let's look at this. Um, inconsistent support. So uh, uh, over here, um, just to remember how this works here, is that uh, in order for this to be, uh, this has to be at R at L, and this has to be at R at P in order for these conditions to hold, right? And anything that these things um, support, they're obviously inconsistent. Anything that they support over here have to be partitioned off from each other. Things that depend on this, can't be done at the same time as the things that depend on that. Okay, so that's inconsistent support. Okay, so uh, the competing needs here is, uh, let me remember what competing needs, sorry. Uh, 
Right. Uh, Kabini needs two actions or mutex of any of the preconditions of the mutex with each other. Right. OK. So um, if the preconditions are competing with each other um, here, uh, if, this is, if this is competing um, also here, uh, then if they're inconsistent, um, then no longer, none of the, the consequent ones can happen either. So these are ways of marking um, uh, these ones of not being consistent. And now when you look, search back, and you're going to try to search through this plan graph, you're going to be able to kind of filter out saying, if I take this one, I can't do these other ones. And I'm going to look here. Um, and basically what you're going to do is walk back on this graph to try to find uh, states that are going to be consistent until you find a path. You can almost think of like a CSP search. Um, essentially the way it works is that um, you're going to uh, generate the graph. Well, if you're given a problem, you're going to generate uh, the graph until you see all the goal uh, states in one of the tiers. And there's no mutexes among those goal states. So that means that they can all exist uh, simultaneously. And what you're going to do is then walk back from that state to see if you can find a path that has no, uh, that's consistent and has no mutexes among them. If you can't find that, you expand the, uh, the plan graph one more level and try it again. And you're going to keep doing this until you get to a point where it becomes, uh, the, no more literals are added or you're, you're flat, basically. There's, no, there's flat growth. And there's different definitions about what flat growth, but it's a formal definition. And that means that you'll stop your search at that point. If you can't find it, then you can't do it. So um, how you extend your planning graph is um, include, as I said, all the instantiations of the actions, including maintains no ops, that have all their preconditions satisfied at level S, with no two being mutex. Mark as mutex all actions maintain no op powers that are incompatible. And mark as mutex all action action pairs that have competing needs. Once you do this, then you can just look at the state level and then generate all the proposition, propositions uh, that have the effect of some action at the level of A sub I. Uh, and mark as mutex all pairs of propositions that can be generated by mutex action pairs. And again, you're just going to have, the, at that point, consistent paths that you can follow through on the graph. OK. So as I said, the basic algorithm is to grow the planning graph until all goals are reachable and none are pairwise mutex. So there's no problems where you have any, you can get to it, you can find all these steps, you've ruled out all the mutex ones, and it's a consistent plan at that point. So you search the plan graph for the valid plan. If none are found, then add a level to the, uh, to the plan graph and then try it again. Okay, so creating the plan graph is usually very fast. It says it's polynomial time to create this. Um, the size of the uh, T-level uh, planning graph and the time to create it are polynomial in the number of levels, the number of objects in it, the number of operators, and the number of propositions in the initial state. Okay? Okay. So when we search for a plan, we backward chain on the planning graph. Well, there's other ways to do this, but the most popular one is doing backward chaining. And we complete all the goals at one level before going back. At least level I pick a non-mutex subset of actions that achieve the goals at level I plus 1. All right, so you look at the ones, you have your goals that you want to succeed at, and you look at the set of operators that you can do that are not mutex of each other, and those are standard. You can use those. And look back in the plans. Um, the preconditions of these actions becomes the goals at level I, and you keep walking back until you, if you can get to the initial state. If you can't get to it, then you backtrack and you try a different set. Uh, very heuristics can be used for choosing which action to select. So you might, you know, given two different alternatives because of the mutex, or three different alternatives, you might have some notion of length of graph or in a sense of how many conflicts may be there, how many operating in different mutex operations, and you might take the one that appears as an estimate to have the fewest uh, conflicts and search that one first. So you, uh, you build the action subset by iterating over the goals, choosing an action that has the goal as an effect, use an action that was already selected if possible, and then do forward checking on the remaining goals to make sure that you have no inconsistencies. So you uh, basically are just doing a search like we've done in everything else. You know, as I said, when I said like, almost like a CBSP search, in that you're basically looking, 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 until you find out that you can't get back, you're not at your goal state, then you back up and try another set of uh, non-mutex 
uh, actions and walk them back and see if you can do that. And so uh, this has been used very uh, powerfully uh, to solve a number of problems. As you notice, it's got this kind of weird combination of both partial ordering in that there are sets of uh, disjunctive uh, states and operators. And they are also um, uh, linear in that they're, the sets are linear in their state space, in the states and actions in the plane graph. OK. So that's a uh, plan graph, or graph plan. Um, and uh, I, that's a, as I said, it has been used uh, fairly successfully, although it has some limitations on, um, on some of the problems. Another uh, interesting approach that a lot of people use is taking our CSP techniques directly and trying to solve uh, the planning problem using CSP techniques. And here, really, the key here is how you define your variables, how you set up your variables. So assume that a plan has k actions. It just take k actions to succeed at a plan. You want to create a binary variable for each possible action a um, of all the actions you can take at that at each of the steps, and true if the action a is used at that step. All right, so you can imagine that's a pretty big space, right? Huge space, in fact. Create variables for each proposition that can hold at different points in time, and then the idea is just to try to find an assignment where they're all consistent. So some of the constraints you can put on this is only one action can be executed at each time. So uh, and remember the, that it's uh, that CSP was commutative. Uh, uh, so this is the same way. Um, one, only one action can be uh, executed at one time. Constraints so that means you're basically solving one variable at a time. Uh, constraints describing effects of actions. Um, you make sure that the actions are consistent and that if you're at one state, you can't solve the other one. And if you get to a point where you have no more operators and you're not at your goal state, then you've got to backtrack and try something else. Uh, persistence, if any action does not change, then you assume that that proposition still holds. All right? And a proposition is true at step i only if some action, possibly a maintained action, made it true. Constraints for initial state and goal states. So again, it's just basically assigning variables to each of these states and then trying to walk through it. And then once you've modeled the problem with each of these variables holding each of these states, um, noting that you have to try to figure out how many steps that you take the plan in, which is a big limitation, um, you can now just go ahead and use your best CSP solver that you have available to you. All right, and there are different ways to do this. So if you go ahead and do that, um, you know, now we've transformed it into, into something that we know how to attack. Again, all these problems have very similar things in that even with all the great assumptions that we made, limiting assumptions about being a closed world assumption, about observability, about actions that being deterministic, all these things happening, all these planners suffer from, in most cases, in real world problems. Um, they don't compute in any kind of real time. Um, so uh, the CSP solvers are great. You're subject to the speed of the CSP and the complexity of the problem that you set up when you set up the planning problem as a CSP. All right, so it's great, typically on very big problems with lots of dynamics. Um, this is one of the reasons that you don't see a lot of uh, planning, uh, real straight, pure planning systems, generic planning systems in applications in the real world because the problems are too big, there's too much uncertainty, and they don't be, they're not able to compute it. But as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just using this as an example to point it out, is that if you can convert it, to a variable assignment to be at each step in the plan, then you can just use the CSP techniques. Okay, so there are lots of different variations. There are lots of different planners uh, out there. Um, I'm just giving you just a couple examples here, just to give you some state of that. Uh, one of them is um, Fast Forward, which was a, uh, a really uh, kind of a neat planner that did very well at that uh, planning competitions that I've talked about at the. Uh, ICAPS conferences that they do uh, interviewly. Um, and one of the things that Ford changed, the, the, the big thing that, that it did was to relax the problem. It basically said, I'm just going to solve the problem not paying attention to the deletes. I'm just not going to pay attention to the deletes. And I'm just going to see how I can insert to get to the, the space that I want to get to get to my goal state. So I'm just going to match on the plans based on going to the, uh, looking at the ads in all these states. And it would relax that problem. And then when it would get there, it would go back and say, all right, now if I look at, really look at the deletes, is anything going to happen bad? 
And most, and, you know, on average, it did much better that way. And on the other ones, it would have to go backtrack and then try to deal with the deletes. Another one was this um, was black box. Um, black box. Um, oh, I should say also that there were lots of little heuristics and tweaks in this thing too. It was highly um, engineered in a sense. Um, black box was sort of this uh, strip based uh, based plane representation that we saw uh, on Monday, and it generates again the planning graph that we just looked at. Um, and then it has this kind of conjunctive normal form representation where we see all the possible sets of actions it can do at each time. And then it assigned variables to these things and tried to see if I could do uh, assign a CSP or a SAT solver and use the CSP solver to solve this. So this is sort of a hybrid approach, using the plane graph to set up the variables, once you have the variables, to limit those ranges and values, and then use a SAT thing to solve it. All right. Some other things we're going to talk about um, now. Moving on, this is like this great. This is a great thing about a, one of these comprehensive courses is that you touch enough just to get confused on each one of them. Um, believe me, I know what that's like. Um, so, but here we are. We're gonna, but again, what you should know, and what's the important thing about this, is that you know in general what these things represent, um, and that you understand. Uh, if you see this term, it's not going to be like, oh, I don't know what that is. All right. Um, these next few things are basically just going to be brief descriptions of these things so you recognize the terms and what they mean. Um, hierarchical task network um, planning um, is something that you often see for real world applications that are planning that are out there or planning like. Um, you often see this representation. All right? um, and the motivations behind this is that for many problems, or at least parts of problems, you know, uh, we may already have an idea of how to solve them, right? It's not like we're going to look for all these, we put all these operators out there and all these generic operators and we're like, okay, look to combine them in any order and we'll find some order that's consistent and we'll get a solution. The reality is I know that if I'm going to go to Neil Simon, I'm going to pick up my bag, I'm going to put that in there, I'm going to walk there, I'm going to walk there, I'm going to go down the stairs, I'm going to open my door in my office, I'm going to be there. And that plan basically holds true no matter, you know, for most of the time, okay? And because I have domain information, I have sort of a recipe for how to do things. Now, that was a very specific plan I just outlined to you. But you can imagine some variables in that plan, you know, about how I get from one place to another place, um, that I could follow up very cleanly. You know, I'm gonna, I'll do one of three things. I'll take the, take the bus, I'll drive my car, I'll do this. And I want to take advantage of that structure to limit the search, right? So somehow I need to be able to capture those recipes and those alternatives I have to do. And so when I have to do something like, some task, which is like travel from here to there, I can go look at my uh, plan library and say, oh, how do I get there from there? And here are my couple, few ways of doing it. All right, so it's not going to solve and find all different solutions. But on the other hand, it seems to be very effective at handling situations that are fairly prescribed and that we know how to do in the world. We're not looking for novel solutions. We're looking for them to apply to advance our planning. So humans, as I said, humans often use plan templates and adapt them to fit the details of the particular problem. Right? I mean, most of the times, we're not starting from like, oh, I'm here. OK, how do I get to there? Right? Oh, wow, the world's a big place. You know, I don't know what to do now. Um, I, could, I could move an inch. I could move a mile. I could, you know, I don't know which way. I could go that direction, that direction. You know, and then we don't look at all those search spaces. You know, we don't look at all those different things. We have a really prescribed idea. You know, we're like, oh, directional vector. I'm going to go this way. If there's nothing in front of me, if there is something in front of me, maybe I have some planning algorithm to go around that. Um, but my point is, is that we have very directed information, and it guides us to what we do. So if we have these things, for a lot of things, in particular, you know, prescribed things and how we do in life, we want to be able to encode those things. And we encode those things in what these HTN, or often what you'll see in the real world applications, HTN-like things. All right? And the question is, um, how to enable planning to take lever to leverage uh, uh, this template knowledge? All right? How do we... Given that we can have these kind of, uh, so the disadvantage of not turning it off when you come in and turning it back on is apparently there's a timeout. All right, so hold on one sec. He's not in his head, so he knows that that's true. <laughs> yeah. Is there also a minimum wait time? <laughs> okay. Come on. Oh, yes. Um, 
So I'll talk because uh, apparently there's a projector time. It takes time for the projector to cool off before I can turn back on. So uh, we will, uh, I'll keep talking about this. So the hierarchical task network, um, essentially uh, you're trying to encode the set of steps that you know is your, your recipe. Um, it would be nice if I could get the slides back up, but there's not much I can do at the moment right now. It has a progress bar, so hopefully soon it'll be coming on. But the idea here is that we want to um, build up these tasks. And we'll build up tasks that will look sort of like, you know, um, if I had something like this. This would be how I would travel from X to Y, right? And then this is sort of a, you have different methods for doing this, right? Ooh, that's good. <laughs> so this is, one of the slides we'll get to is replanning. This is replanning. And of course, where I just was starting to draw my diagram is now covered. Um, if we get this here. Hallelujah. All right. So, uh, as I said, now we want to encode these recipes. And so how do we encode these recipes that people, these templates that people use? So you might have something like a, a task represents, uh, we, we do this using a structure called a, a task. And a task represents a recipe for achieving states. Uh, the primitive tasks, the ones that are executable, basically, the ones that you can do, um, are uh, the ground in the literals of the domain ontology. Uh, the non-primitive tasks, are further decomposed into subtasks uh, subject to constraints. Okay, so I'll, and then planning is searching through the network for a consistent set of tasks for the to the goal from the initial state. So suppose I have a task to travel from X to Y. I have a method taxi travel and I have a method air travel, and I have the X or Y that comes here, and I have a uh, get taxi. So these are subtasks in here. Um, these particular ones in this ontology um, are primitive, non-decomposable. So these are the ones that you can actually execute and apply the operators. You have get, uh, get taxi, uh, rider X, ride XY, and then pay the driver. Right? So one of the things you should note about this is, hey, I need money. Right? I need some kind of money here. Right? So what's not shown here are some of the preconditions that you have to have in order to satisfy this. Um, so when you come down here, you may have to have preconditions to be satisfied. And so as you instantiate this plan and trying to realize it, you have to make sure those preconditions are matched. All right. Same thing, you have to be at the right location. And you know, but these are going to be instantiated. Travel from you know here to Newell Simon. Now you know I have to be at X and I have to be at Y, and I would have to have the money and that help the tax driver in here. Um, the other way to do it is the uh, air travel, which is again uh, the get the get the ticket, um, travel uh, from there. Uh, these are um, constrained. Uh, fly must happen after both of these happen, right? You could do, um, and then when you fly, you can travel from A to Y to Y. So the key here is that you have alternative ways. You use these task descriptions, and usually the task descriptions will have a name. They have a set of um, expected variables. Um, they have a set of uh, what it means to be done, and they have a set of preconditions that have to be done on them. And they may differ depending on the method that you use. So when you go to solve this, the idea is to decompose. That is to work down. Typically, there are different search orders, but the most common one is uh, where you go forward searching. And you basically go down here, and you try this one first, and this one fails, and you go over here and try this one. All right? Note that this could be one element in a bigger test network. 
right? So you can be working through components of that, and you basically are recursively going down forward until you find solutions. All right, so here's a, an example of this being uh, searched and finding a solution. So if I come down here, I get the ticket, I go to travel website, find flights. If I can't find any flights in here, then I have to backtrack, and I'll try the other method here. All right? So again, the, the key thing to remember about the HTNs is that it allows you to encode it's just a very natural way to represent information that you have about the world. It's not as flexible and open scaled as a general generic planner would be, but it allows you to do a lot of real world things because you're not going to, you, like for example, as you're doing something in the military, they have very prescribed policies on how to do things. There's no sense to have a very open planner that can mix and match everything that you want because they're not going to accept it. And if you were trying to model it, you'd have to put so many constraints in it to guarantee that those things would never occur together that it would be better just to be able to specify those few processes that you could do and limit it that way. So in some sense, you're decomposing the abstract plan into literal finals rather than constructing a plan the way we were doing with the other planners. We were constructing up the plan. Here, we sort of implicitly have possible ways to do the plan, and we're decomposing until we find one that's consistent with the literals and the initial state that we have. Okay, so HTNs are, as I said, are widely used in the real world applications. Um, often one of the, the big benefits is they like, the, what you often see is you'll see this plan library of these template tasks and um, what the sort of the tagline or the advertisement about these things is that if you want to expand the system, you simply add new templates, right? It's not quite true because if you need to add new ontology or new <coughs> operators, new modeling information, um, it becomes a little bit more expansive than that. But the idea here is, again, is you have these templates, and then if you have something new that you have to do, then you just add a new template for that new structure, for that new process. And so it's incrementally can create these things. Um, they are successful because, as you can imagine, the search is less expensive, and so you can compute them in very quick times. What they're not good is coming up with novel configurations of terms, because you're limited to whatever those constructs are that you've encoded in your task descriptions. Okay. Um, there are a number of uh, domain independent HTM planners. By domain independent, what I mean is that they provide sort of a language for representing the tasks. And then you can define sort of the semantics to those tasks using some kind of functional description of a, some function that you assign to it to check for it. Um, and these are all made by a number of people. You know, Sipe2, by Dave Wilkins, Shop2, by uh, Dana Now. Um, as you can imagine, these things start off, you know, Site 1 and Site 2 were not exactly the HTNs, and then when they decided it was HTNs, and they became on, uh, more expanded. Uh, o plan, there are other ones too. Um, one of the things that's kind of neat is that um, Shop 2 is fairly, really, really simple to use. Um, and it is um, available free as a toolkit, um, either, you know, one which you probably don't care about, it's Lisp, but another one is in Java. Um, and you can represent things and try uh, little problems in that. Okay, so another, uh, again, I'm not going to go into great detail of this, another type of planning that's done, so we're adding to our, our repository of different planning techniques that we have available to us, um, is something called case-based planning. Um, case-based planning was very big, uh, uh, you know, it was very, very big sort of before 2000, and then sort of lost some of its luster because of a problem that I'll talk about that's really difficult to handle. Um, the idea of a case-based plans is that you have a library of cases, of examples that have plans in them that were successfully or not successfully done previously. And then the general idea is to try to match the structure of a new problem that comes in and saying, wow, that problem looks a lot like that case. And look, that case, I was able to do that plan doing it that way. So I'm going to use that plan that I was successful in there to solve the plan of my new problem. All right? So it's a pretty, you know, sort of not a pretty easy idea to do that. And I think we do that a lot of the times. A lot of times we think, oh, I did that that way. And if I just do something a little bit different, I'll be able to handle this. All right? So 
there's a notion of similar. When is one case similar to the current problem? Right? Some kind of dimensionality that you're going to be looking on. And so you have to identify ways that you're going to look at two cases to see that they're similar. Um, that similarity, what they call some often call similarity metrics, um, is basically are you looking for similar actors? Are you looking for similar structure, similar products? Um, a lot of times it's just similar features. You know, the, this problem is a very similar features to that problem. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, one of the most uh, famous early on uh, case-based planners was something called Chef by Chris Hammond. And um, it was a toy domain, as often they did, which was cooking. Um, and so there were, in his case library, there were a set of cases for successfully cooking, um, cooking uh, different ingredients together. And now you have two new ingredients that you don't have a case for that you're trying to cook together, which I think one of the examples was like um, steak and broccoli or something like that. And uh, you look to say, all right, is, this, is there a way I can cook this that will make this work out? You know, can I cook those two together and it'll be a successful uh, meal? And uh, one of the cases that they saved, they don't only save successes, but they save failures, is they had a case of that being, uh, along with some other ingredients, um, having too much water in it. And so that was considered a failure. So they had techniques then for adapting the plan that was in there uh, so that you could change it and you could substitute out. And you could substitute out you know, chicken for steak or something like that. And by doing that, you could then come up with a plan that would work. So some of the problems were is how do you find the similar situations there? Um, here, in that particular case, it was almost identity. He's like, if any of these features are any part of the other plan, any components of the other plan, then that's a match. Um, you can imagine more spatially things where you map things sort of along dimensional values and cases get put into that n-dimensional space. And then you could say, find me the case that's closest to that by looking at the n-dimensional space and say summing or doing some vector analysis for the distance between those different cases. Um, and then you'd find the one that was sort of close as long as it's within some threshold of tolerance. Or multiple cases. Once you find one, once you retrieve it, then you have the, the big, uh, huge issue of how do you adapt them. So given that I have this operator here, and I have this plan here, and they're grounded literals, and this is something I want to do here, how do I change out the components that were in this plan and use it over here, and maybe change even a step here to be successful here? And this adaptation uh, was a problem that really plagued case-based reasoning. Because you've tr with, there's lots of kind of trivial ways to do it, a lot of ways to do it, um, that you can imagine substitution or having uh, other knowledge in the system, uh, such as you know, just kind of rules in the system or models in the system that say these two things don't go together. And, and then using that to apply when you do the adaptation. Um, but it was very, very hard. It was very, it's been very hard it was, and it had very limited scope because you had to use this kind of special information to do this. So there was no real general way to do this. I think we still do this um, very often. We'll do this type of planning on, in particular cases in real world application, but it's in very prescribed situations. The general situation of doing adaptation is very hard. Okay, does everybody see that? Try to change an existing plan that's fully grounded and fully enumerated and then apply it to some other plan that the differences in those components and the difference in those steps may or may not make a difference. And how do you know? All right. So I did actually a lot of work in case-based planning, and that's why I'm sounding so dejected about it. Um, um, we all turn in the road sometime. Um, but it was a lot of work, and uh, some of the people that worked in this area, uh, if you want to look at some of the seminal people that looked at some of this work, uh, where was Edwina Rislin, uh, Janet Lodner, um, uh, Phyllis Cotton, um, and um, also uh, the earlier work, and, and there's this whole school of work that came out of Yale under Roger Shank. Um, they were also known for the natural language processing. Um, they had a particular very different model for natural language processing. We'll talk a little bit about when we get to that subject. But there was a whole school of those grad students and their descendants that also worked on this kind of case-based reasoning or versions of it. Okay, uh, David Leake. Um, um, Oh, I can't remember that guy's name, but there are other people off the top of my head. So 
in the adaptation, if adaptation ends up being, at worst, a scratch from scratch search, then this question applies. You know, does it help? Right? Does that help us do anything? Okay. So contingent planning. Um, contingent planning is this notion of now instead of having just a linear plan, these are the set of steps that I'll do to solve this problem, I'm actually going to put branches in the plan that say, hey, when I'm doing this plan, I'm going to look, see, during the execution, did this happen? If this didn't happen, if something else happened, maybe I should do something else. And so I might plan, have contingent branches. Now, as soon as I say branches to you, um, you guys should be saying, oh, that can cause problems, right? And what, what is one of the major problems that branches would have? Um, say again, well, branching factor is one. But an additional one is that just because doesn't mean, if I have branches, doesn't mean that I can do them simultaneously, right? Because they might have shared resources. And this one might require resources. And if I do this one, I can't do this one. And if they're consumable resources, and I try this one halfway down it, you know, I have to make sure that I can still do this one. Because I may have consumed the resources that can do this. So it's not, you know, when you plan the branches, you want to plan them. Um, if you're checking at the branch point, then you're not so concerned with that. Because then you're, not, you're only trying one of them. But if you're being able to backtrack and jump back to a point in the, in the plan and try a different branch, you have to make sure that the other branches are going to be consistent depending on where you go down and how many resources you use. So there are some issues. It's not you know, easy to do this. But you're right. The search base gets larger because now you have alternative paths. Um, as I said, you usually just plan for points where it is, uh, you think it's going to be significant. You're not trying to do every possible thing that can go wrong in the world. Right? You just, that's too much. So uh, it highly makes the plan more robust in, the, in doing execution, um, but it doesn't guarantee a successful execution. It may be that you didn't pick the right points. Right? But the advantage here is, again, is that you're strengthening your plan to deal with it. And notice that you have to monitor the execution of your plan in order to detect which branch you're going to take at execution time. So because you're checking the state during execution to say, oh, okay, this is the outcome that really happened. I thought it was going to be this way, but now it's going to be this way. And the reason I don't know is because now the effects are not deterministic, right? Just because I do something, I may do this, it may have this effect, or it may have this effect. An action doesn't have a definitive result. Okay. Um, uncertainty and contingencies. Uh, so a, I'll go really quickly through this. There's a flat tire example. Uh, testing for a hole will be part of the plan. So uh, you're, you're gonna, one of the, the things that you don't know, it's a discovery, you don't know it, and you don't know it at plan time. You only know it at execution time. You're going to look for something. If you find a hole, you're going to do this. If you don't find a hole, you do something else. Right? So information and gathering step has two outcomes. Previously, we assumed deterministic effects. Why planning with information gathering is hard is because you have to uh, both prescribe in a planning ahead, you want to prescribe in case you see these things, and yet um, you don't know until execution time. Um, finally, you also need to deal with broken plans. You know, what happens if your assumptions are wrong, your adversaries outflanked you, um, your unmodeled effects, things that didn't happen. You basically didn't get the outcome that you expected when you did the planning in the first place, and now I have a violation and I have to do something different. And you'd like to be able to, contingent planning is a way to hedge against that uncertainty. It doesn't solve the uncertainty. Right? So I'm not going to go into, uh, I'm not going to go to a mail thing. The only thing I really want to point out here is uh, universal conformant planning. This is a way that you would guarantee that the plan would execute no matter what, but it typically means manipulating the environment into a coarse situation. So for example, if you want to have, um, if you want to have two chairs of the same color, you know, you are going to force it by not saying, oh, what color is that and what color is that? Are they the same? Is it good? Is it, what color is that? Then I'll paint the same color as that. That's not the kind of plan you're going to do. You're going to say, I'm going to paint both red. Right? And by painting both red, I'm guaranteed I'm going to get the right solution. So you can only do it in particular states that you can do this. And it's things that you have total control over. All right? Um, we're already past our time. So again, uh, don't forget about the proposals. We'll set up a, a criteria for it. But meanwhile, use the informal one that I presented at the beginning of class. Okay?